and a certificate for the Woodhouse <laughs> Spa because I think you're going to need it. <laughs> She's been working super hard this week to get the school ready. We need prayer for that as we continue to do that. There's cleanup that needs to be done around there. So if you guys want to come out this week, this week is critical for us. Chainsaws. Chainsaws. That's right. So Miss Jean, thank you, and thank you for all the work you've done with the children. You've done an excellent job. All right, let's go to Lord in prayer. Our Father, our God, Lord, thank you for this day. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open them up to the book of Matthew. Book of Matthew. The Gospel. We had a good trip um, because of brevity of time. We have a video we wanted to show you, but we're not showing it this morning uh, because of our time constraints. But I want to invite you to Wednesday so that the admissions team can give a report. If you've not been on a Wednesday night, we encourage you to come. It'll be a Bible study kind of deal, but you're going to get to see what we've been able to accomplish on the mission field in Nicaragua with the sister school that we have there in Condega. And um, it's going to, I think you're going to like what you see. And uh, you just thank you for your prayers for all those that were uh, praying for us. We needed those, uh, and uh, we appreciated them very much. In Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, we're looking at verses 20 through 28 in a sermon entitled Selfishness to Servanthood, and we are in the study to serve or not to serve. We're talking about um, serving, and we're finishing up this study next week. Look at Matthew, chapter uh, 20. We're going to hold on that uh, for a second. Have you ever... Um, tried to make a U-turn in a place you're not supposed to make a U-turn. I don't want any confessions right now, but uh, some of you probably have tried that and either uh, hit a curb or uh, got pulled over and were given a ticket, or uh, you saw that there was a place uh, that you were unsure about making a U-turn. But what, what we see oftentimes is no U-turn, right? We see or, or, or a no U-turn. There's not this sign that says, you should make a U-turn. There's usually just says, no U-turn. But in the Christian life, uh, I'd like to uh, give you a thought and put this into your head this morning, that uh, God commands us to make U-turns in our life very often. And uh, sometimes we find ourselves moving along and we're struggling and we're trying to balance life. And he's like, you know what? If you'll just make that U-turn, you'll find out that... Uh, Life is going to be much different. Well, uh, in the culture we live in, we struggle with a lot of stuff. And we're going to see an interesting story here in Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 20, about a mom who's trying to uh, position her two boys. Let's look at verse 20 in chapter 20 of Matthew. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came down to Jesus with her sons bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left this is not mine to give, but it is for the purpose for whom it has been prepared by my father. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave just as the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many let's pray father god we pray that you would open our hearts and minds to this word help us to understand it and apply it in our lives help us to understand what servanthood is 
that that in the Christian kingdom is indeed leadership. For we ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Well, when we look at this and we look at uh, these, the, this story, uh, paint, paint a picture real quick. These two guys, James and John, James would be martyred. He says, you indeed are going to drink this cup. He's going to die for what he said. John is going to go to the island of Patmos where he's going to be exiled. He'll be the only disciple of the 12 disciples not killed for what he believed. But he will be permanently exiled on the island of Patmos. He's telling them, you are going to indeed drink this thing. Because both of these guys spoke up and said, man, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to do whatever, uh, whatever, you, whatever you tell us to do. I, I'm ready to go for you, Lord. And I think sometimes when we're sitting in a pew and it's comfortable and it's sunny outside, it's easy for us to say, man, I'll do that. I'll serve the Lord. But when it comes down to the rubber hitting the road, we struggle. And there's a struggle here that these guys have. I want you to catch this part of the scripture where it says those 10 other guys became indignant. He's talking about the 12 other disciples. So these guys who had been walking around with Jesus for a very long time at this point were ticked off at these two guys coming up asking for positions over those guys. And what they were ticked off about is because they asked before they did. They were like, why do those guys get to sit next to you? How about us? And so it was a fight about who was going to sit where. Well, when we understand this idea about servanthood and what Jesus is saying here, he's painting this picture that is going to be much different than what we believe it to be in our world. When we talk about repentance and we talk about those things in your salvation experience, he's talking about uh, the, the word, uh, this U-turn that Jesus is talking about is, is, is about repent. And repent literally means to turn 180 degrees and to go in a different direction. When we decide we are going to follow Jesus Christ, we're walking along with him. And it literally means we're going to come to a place and stop and turn in 180 degrees in the opposite direction and start following Jesus. Can I have that slide up there? All right. So when, when you get there and this, you make this 180 degree turn in your life, we need to understand that it means a radical change is going to occur. Now, I want to differentiate that with you. Because sometimes we have people come forward in church, they make a decision, and it's an emotional decision, and they say, man, I really need Jesus in my life because something horrible is going on in their life, and they come to a place where God's brought them to their knees, and they want to get right with the Lord, so they come forward and they do that. But, and they come forward, they, they say a prayer, and they think that maybe by baptism, and maybe because I'm coming forward like this, that things are going to change. And we're waiting for God like, like a Coke machine that you put a dollar in, and you're expecting a Coke to get have in return. I'm expecting him to fix this issue in my life. And sometimes when it doesn't occur, that person gets ticked off, and they just say, well, Christianity doesn't work. And that's just not true. You see, Christianity is a black and white thing. It is not an emotional thing. There are some churches that are teaching, teaching emotionalism within their uh, belief system, but emotions wear off. Your decision to follow Christ is a black and white decision where you say, you know what? I'm not going to go this way anymore. I am stopping and I'm going to purposely follow Christ. And you have made a conscious decision to do it. Watch this. And you actually physically do it. You actually physically commit. It is a commitment that you are making within your heart to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. This is the repentance idea of what that means in that 180 degree turn. The scripture says if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So something happens to that individual that they are changed. Here's a question in 2017 right where you are. Have you changed since you decided to follow Christ? Has there been a difference? Is there a desire to want to serve? Is there a desire to do that? Because what he is telling these disciples is, it is a big deal. It is going to change you radically. But that, that decision is going to be in your heart. Now, the problem is, is if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, you've never made that commitment, you don't know what that feels like. You don't know what that means. It is, the, it is God simply knocking at the door, and you've never opened the door in your life to allow him to come in and say, okay, everything I've got is yours. When that scripture in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 talks about, I will open the door and come into you and fellowship with you and be with me, the literal word means to dine with you. 
It means I'm going to lay down by the table and I'm going to eat an intimate with, meal with you. It means that when he says, I am going to come in and dine with you, that before you eat in the Hebrew culture, your feet are going to be washed and we are going to come to a place where I'm going to humble myself and clean you up or you're going to clean me up and we're going to know everything about each other and we're going to sit there and we're going to dialogue about life. And we're going to do that the rest of our life. And I'm going to know everything about your heart because you've allowed me to see it. Now watch this. He already knows what's in your heart. He's wanting you to say, I'm okay with letting you see everything. He wants to know that you're okay with it. For some reason in our humanness, we think when we go into a closet, Jesus Christ doesn't know what's in there. For some reason, we think that what I do at work, Jesus doesn't know about. For some reason, we think what I have going on on the computer, Jesus doesn't know about. But he says, I already know about it. And I'm waiting for you, watch this. I'm waiting for you to U-turn and follow me. Where are we, 2017? Where are we right now in our walk with Christ? The world's definition of greatness is different than God's. I want you to come on Wednesday to see that video because it's, it's important we understand what servanthood is. And I'm not saying that we, we exercise servanthood. I just want to see, get a picture of what that is because the world's definition of servanthood is what these two guys thought it was. Put me in a position to where I could have some status. Let me, let me work my way up into the church until I have an important enough position that people would then uh, see me as important. But he says, that's not how it works. It says you need to humble yourself and serve other people. And this is the process that, that God gives us. The world's definition is far different. There's a guy named Robert Fulgham. He wrote a book, All I Really Need to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten. Some of you may have read it. It's a good book if you haven't. Man, those naps, those are good. <laughs> Remember graham crackers and milk and a nap and a towel, man. If we had that in every workplace, I think we would be rocketing out there in the world. But all the things that he writes about, one of the things that uh, he, he writes about is that he has a picture of another woman on his mirror at home. Now, that could get you in a lot of trouble if it's the wrong woman on your mirror. But this particular woman was a humped back little old lady in a blue overcoat. And her name was Mother Teresa. And this was his driver. He put it up there every day and he asked himself over and over again, am I um, as humble as this lady is? Am I, um, do I have a servant heart like this lady? It was a reminder for him every day when he went out to be a servant to other people. My challenge is pretty simple this morning. Are we willing to turn our back on the world's definition of greatness? Are we really ready to outrun what the world says to do? Turn the back on competitors getting to the top of the ladder, leading the rat race. The higher you go, the more people you pass up, the greater you are. Are we really willing to turn our back on that and claim Jesus Christ's definition of greatness? His definition, as we looked at it in the scripture this morning, as we're reading that, is pretty amazing. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. He uses this term, interestingly, in the scripture right here because he says it is a position of slavery that you are willing to take on. He says a, per a person who is willing to become a slave. That means you're willing to submit to this person's authority. Watch this indefinitely in your life and you are doing it with purpose are you willing to make christ the lord of your life purposely and to live for him on what he is asking you to do people's misconstrued idea of what christianity is isn't a list of rules and regulations on how to dress but it is in fact saying i am going to follow him but it is a simple answered question this morning we are either following christ completely or we're not it's pretty simple You've given him all of your life, or we have given him only part of our life. 
We've given them our whole Sunday, or we've given them our Saturdays even, and we've given, you know, Wednesday nights, but we have not given Mondays and Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays. We've not given them the baseball field. We've not given them the workplace. We've not given them our relationships. We've not given them those things. We've not given them our addictions. We've not given them any of those things that we're struggling with. But what he's saying is, I want you to bring all your toys in the toy box and just dump them out right there. I remember when my little kids, uh, when my kids were younger, some other kids would come over to our house, and our house was always a place where kids would come to play. Michael was a little boy at the time. And uh, there was somebody who was coming in there, and this little kid was like breaking toys. It was just like, you know, he just like to break toys. He'd come in there and stuff like that. And uh, this person was coming over to the house again, and, and he was there. And uh, I said, hey, let that kid go play. Uh, in your room with you with your toys and Mike would go to his toy box and he would open his toy box and he would take one out and go, okay, you can have this one. <laughs> he wasn't willing to give up the whole toy box. He was just giving the ones that he, he could break this one and I wouldn't be so heartbroken about it. Now watch this. I think oftentimes in our life we're, we're like that. Here God, I'll give you this because this ain't going to hurt me too much. This isn't very much of a commitment. But what God really wants, watch this. What God really wants, watch this, is your whole toolbox. Amen. The whole garage. Amen. Your whole life. This is what he wants from us. Are we willing to turn our back on the world's definition of greatness? This message to do that has implications far beyond the church in Addis and far beyond churches in the United States. It has worldwide implications. We're currently involved in a war on terror in the world. We're currently involved in missions in the South. We're currently involved in a bunch of different things uh, as a church, uh, as a country, as all, all these things that people are, are a part of. And we know that they're going on around us, but perhaps we're not totally aware of those things. In order to win the minds and hearts of the world, we must first become the world's best servants. The best way you could possibly witness is by being a servant to another person. It's not telling them how great of a Christian you are. It's not telling them that you're a Christian at all. It's simply serving them. And if we are willing to do that, we can change the world. I want to challenge you with something this week. As we finish up this series next week. If you're willing to give one hour of your life in worship sitting here. Listen. Would you be willing to give one hour of your life serving? Because that's what Jesus said his definition of leadership is. Would you be willing to give one hour of serving? You know. Our children's director is in the back because we're short again watching kids. She's in the back with the up-and-coming children's director. We shouldn't be back there either, but because we're short on kids, she's back there too. She's back there with the preschool director, who shouldn't be back there either, but it's because they're short too. And in all these areas in our church where we're short, uh, we have the same people seemingly doing those things. And if all of us just committed to just one hour, just one hour a week, if you could commit to 52 weeks of your life a year, I promise you it's less than how much we watch Fox News or CNN. Amen. I promise you it would be less time than we give to the golf course or to whatever hobby is our hobby. If we just said, okay, God, I'm going to serve for one hour a week, and I'm going to worship you for one hour a week. Watch this. Watch this. We would double, we would more than double. We would blow out of the water the effort that we do within our community. Because if those same people that make up 20% of the church who are doing 80% of the work in the church statistically across the nation became 100% of the people, I'm telling you, people would come to know Christ over and over and over again because of the impact we'd be making outside of these walls. Amen? Amen. We struggle and we tend to buy for position, even in the church. 
I want you to look at that scriptural passage where Jesus makes this crystal clear in, in, in verses 20 through 28. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He has this rendezvous with the cross that he's on his way to. These guys have been walking around with him for three years. He has the disciples stop for lunch. They have a visitor who's the mother of James and John. She comes and she pulls Jesus and her sons aside for a confidential word. You ever had that? When one of those guys in church goes, hey, can I talk to you for a minute over here? You know it's going to be important because they want to talk to you over here away from where everybody else can hear you and we shouldn't be like that we need to be transparent about who we are Amen. but she calls them away from those other guys off to the side and says I want to have a conversation with you specifically about my two boys and she talks about them about the kingdom and she pleads let my sons have those positions in your cabinet if you will and Jesus replies, in effect, you don't understand what you're asking. Those top places in the kingdom carry a pretty big price tag. Are you prepared to pay the price? And the price that he's talking about to drink that cup of suffering, they said, oh, oh yeah, we're ready. And I don't think they really understood what they were asking. I don't think oftentimes when we come forward and make a decision to say, hey, we're going to become a Christian, we don't really understand what that means. It means, would you be willing to stand up for Christ in everything that you do. That means we will have to deny ourselves in some areas in our lives. Amen. He says, you will indeed drink from that cup. And as it turned out, James was martyred. John spent the latter part of his life exiled on the island of Patmos. He said, it's not his spot, Jesus said, to assign those top spots in the kingdom. That's the Father's business. Somehow the other disciples, when they got wind of it, they were angry. How come? Because the other disciples wanted to ask the same thing. I think it is inherent in our nature that we struggle with position and we struggle with authority. We struggle with prestige. Well, I don't want to rock babies because nobody's going to see me back there. I need a position, you know, where I could maybe be on the stage or where I could, I, I could, uh, you know, can I do something like where people could see that I'm being used? I don't want to park cars. Nobody's going to see me out there and that orange vest just doesn't go. <laughs> I want to be able to do something, you know, where, where I could be known. And this was the problem that James and John's mom was pitching to Jesus. Jesus, I think, had the first come to Jesus speech <laughs> with somebody right here. He calls time out. He has the first come to Jesus speech, wanting to be a leader is fine, but leadership in his kingdom is divided by servanthood. Whoever is the best servant is also the best leader. Jesus practiced what he preached. He specialized in those menial tasks that everyone else tried to avoid, tending to children, watch this, fixing breakfast. Remember on the beach when he was putting the fish? You know, the disciples didn't normally do that. They had the boys there toss some fish on the fire for us. The disciples complained when he was putting the child on his knee. And Jesus fussed at him for it. Watch this. Jesus would have been back there rocking the babies more comfortably than he would be sitting here with you next to you. Amen. And then he would fuss at you for saying he should be up here on the stage. He'd be in the kitchen cooking on Wednesdays over and over and over again, pushing it out the window because that's the kind of heart that he had. He was serving lepers, watch this. He was going to Condega, Nicaragua, to feed kids and help kids that don't have the fortune that you have. He did those kinds of things. He went underneath the overpass and fed the homeless because that was important. You see, leadership is defined by servanthood. 
And leadership is defined by some of the actions of Jesus that we're going to see here. I want to share some with you. I want you to remember, the night before Jesus died for us, he found a pretty graphic way to illustrate servanthood. He and the disciples gathered for their last supper together. But no one was willing to perform the most unpleasant job. All the disciples were standing there. They had been walking with Jesus. And at this point in their ministry, they understood who, they, who he was. <clears throat> but nobody offered to wash his feet. They were about to eat. That's what you did before you got up there. It was usually on a dais in the room because the floors were dirt on the outside. And when you walk in, you would come to a place where you would sit on a low couch and you would take your shoes off. And in this position, you'd take your shoes off. And before you went up on the dais barefoot onto a carpet that was usually rolled out there, they had a low table. And on that low table where they would have the Lord's Supper, you would recline like this in this fashion. Your feet were right there next to the guy you were eating with because he was sitting right here. It wasn't a table where you put your feet underneath. There were no chairs. They sat like that. You couldn't touch his feet because you would be defiled because of what you walked on in the streets before you came in. So the worst guy, the least guy, the servant, watch this, the slave, was the one who usually washed the feet because then me as the master could go give sacrifice for him because he would now be defiled. Because he took the sin that you had touched and put it on himself. So when we understand really what this is about this morning, you understand that the creator of the world came in and took your shoes off to clean your feet so that you would be able to come to the altar and participate in what you wouldn't be allowed to do unless you were clean. As they stood around wondering who was going to clean whose feet, Jesus is the one who wraps the towel on himself, takes his clothes off so that he doesn't defile himself, wraps a garment around his waist, and he goes and he cleans their feet. He washes their feet. The task was necessary because of those roads. You remember what he did? He got up from the table and he fastened a towel around him and he took a basin of water. Now what's interesting in this story is that they all got around the table and they weren't going to do it. Watch this. We hear sermons and we are convicted. And we know that the we can sign up right there by the window and say I I'll help park cars. But we don't because we're waiting for somebody else to do it. And that's what they were all doing. They all went up there with their dirty feet, with their sin. And they all were waiting for somebody else to do what, watch us, they were not willing to do. He washes their feet, the Son of God, the Master of heaven and earth. He washes our feet. And approximately, 15 hours after them, he washing their feet, he was going to allow himself to be nailed to a cross. He was going to allow himself. Pontius Pilate said, just tell me you're innocent, I will let you go. He couldn't stand the Jews. But he remained silent. And he didn't answer him anything. He was purposely going to the cross, watch this, to take care of permanently what he had did, did physically for you and me. Amen. The life of our Lord is a model of progressive humility. God came, became man. That man became a servant. And that servant became a sacrifice. Church, listen to me. We shouldn't look down on James and John. 
we have just as hard a time as they do moving from selfishness to servanthood. Did you catch this? All the disciples, all of the disciples, all of them stood around waiting for somebody to wash their feet. Watch this. What we cannot do to save ourselves, Christ did by going to a cross. Because he loved you. Because he loved me. He says, I'm going to die on purpose. I'm going to sacrifice myself on purpose. I'm throwing myself on the grenade on purpose so that you will live. Amen. And then he says this. Can you lay your pride down and follow me? I already know what you're struggling with. But are you willing to follow me? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to